that doesn't work out very well. Father, we thank you for your great love towards us. We thank you that you're always there. We pray that as we delve deeper into the requirements and conditions of the gospel, that we will sense you've made every provision for us. Help us, Lord, to turn our eyes in the right direction. Protect us now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I'm going to back up a little bit. I have been meaning to read some sections in Christ Object Lessons, so before we go to Acts of the Apostles today, I'd like to go back there. I'm going to be looking at a section starting around page 95, <coughs> but I'm, I'll just read little bits in between. This uh, chapter is about leaven, like unto leaven. Now, when you hear the word leaven, you usually think about sin because that's usually the Bible symbol. You don't want to have the leaven of those Pharisees, that's what Jesus said. But he used leaven in another way. And he was trying to tell us that leaven, once you put it in something, it goes through everything. And that's our subject, is the whole heart. That's what we're trying to understand. When God gets our whole heart, he has everything, and then he can work with it. All right, so leaven then is what's happening here, and that's the context of these statements. I'm going to begin with a little section that begins with a statement, none are so vile, none have fallen so low, as to be beyond the working of this power, the power of God to save. Now, I want to stop in that set, with that sentence just a little bit here. If, if that statement, which is an absolute statement, none are so vile, we certainly should not be discouraged about anything because we're not there. <laughs> <laughs> and even if we think we are, this statement says none are so vile. <laughs> so it doesn't matter, <laughs> okay? None are so vile. None have fallen so low that they're beyond the working of this power. So let us begin with that bit of encouragement because as we talk about obedience, I know the first thing that happens. We begin looking at ourselves and we say, well, wait a minute. I can't do that. That is a natural thing. Then we have to understand that natural is not good. <laughs> okay. We want to know that natural is satanic. The devil's in there someplace. In natural, that's the flesh. That is not God. That is not the gospel. That is not Jesus. It's the flesh. So whenever something comes up natural, don't say, well, it's natural. No, no, okay, but that's satanic. We are trying to talk about something here that only God can do. Now, we have already talked about the will. And I want to read you a statement because there is a very real danger when we start talking about the will. We have to get past that. We have already understood that we need to understand the force of the will, the true force of the will. It's the decision-making part of us. Nothing happens until we decide it. Okay? When you say, oh, I'd like to, oh, I wish, oh, someday, oh, I hope, nothing's going to happen. <laughs> Nothing happens while you're wishing for something. Things begin to happen when you sit down and you weigh all the factors and you count the cost. What will happen if I decide to do this? <laughs> what comes after that? What am I going to have to pay? <laughs> What's it going to do to me? When you 
factor everything in and you see how important it is that when Jesus died for you, he means to take you all the way. And you believe that and you understand it and you decide, well, whatever it costs me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with it. Whatever it costs, even unto death. You see, you haven't really decided until you say, this is what I'm going to do even if it kills me, literally. See? If you decide something only up until the time it's not convenient, you have not decided it. <laughs> You've only said again, well, let's see what happens. Well, God doesn't play that game. He doesn't say, let's see what happens. He said, set it down and decide it and you're never going to change it. That's a decision. So, Knowing that that only comes through the force of the will, now I want to read you another statement about the will. Christ Object Lessons 96. But man cannot transform himself by the exercise of his will. He possesses no power by which to change. This change can be affected. The leaven, that's, that's what this chapter is about. The leaven, something holy from without. See, that's why Jesus is talking about leaven. It has to come from outside. It's got to be put in. Must be put into the meal before the desired change can be wrought. So the grace of God must be received by the sinner before he can be fitted for the kingdom of glory. So although we exercise our will and nothing happens without the exercise of that will, the only thing we're really willing is we're telling God, I'm willing to be made willing <laughs> your way. <laughs> and so we're opening up our heart and saying, Lord, I don't know how any of this works. I don't understand anything. But I have decided whatever you want is the way it's going to go. And when we decide that, something else comes. And we've already been through that part of it. We realize that the only way to know that we're really in the process is when we decide to be obedient. <laughs> Jesus does not save us so we can be disobedient children. I don't know why the churches can't see that. <laughs> it seems to me such a logical, straight arrow thing. Why would God want to save us so we can be disobedient? <laughs> so obviously, God means for us to be obedient children. And we need to understand that. <laughs> we need to know this is God's plan for me to be obedient. <laughs> and so... He puts the leaven in us, whatever the leaven is, the leaven he puts in us so that it will go all the way through us. Okay? Not just a little part here and there. The leaven of grace will work in us. All right, now I'm going to get to the trap that people fall into when they become Christians and understand obedience. Page 97. There are many who try to reform by correcting this or that habit. And they hope in this way to become Christians. But they are beginning in the wrong place. Our first work is with the heart. So when we finally are understanding obedience the correct way, we're not going to start looking at our habits first off. 
That's the wrong place. We just read it here. You cannot get this by trying to correct your habits. You begin to realize, you know, there's something wrong with my heart. <laughs> That's what God has to work on. He has to change that heart. He has to get that heart so that I want the same things he wants. So that I believe the same thing he believes. All right, here's the next sentence in the Spirit of Prophecy. Now, you all have these books, and I'm sure you've read them. But we are going through them to try to pick it apart to see, what did that say? Because <laughs> we read too fast. I know what happens. We just, do, 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 do. okay, I got that page. No, you didn't. <laughs> you know, it takes me a lot. I'm a fast reader. I can read about 2,000 words, you know, on a page just, just like that. But I don't read the Spirit of Prophecy that way. I can't get through the spirit of prophecy. I get one sentence and I'm stuck there for a while. <laughs> and sometimes I never even get past that sentence. It, it tells me to look up another one like that. And I go looking at another one like that. I never read the next sentence. That happens to me so many times. All right. Here's the next sentence. A profession of faith and the possession of truth are two different things. <laughs> yeah, a profession of faith and possession, there's the word, possession of truth are two different things. The heart must be converted and sanctified. Next sentence. The man who attempts to keep the commandments of God from a sense of obligation merely because he's required to do so will never enter into the joy of obedience. He does not obey. Okay? Now, we need to understand these things and check up on ourselves. Am I trying to obey God because he said, thou shalt and thou shalt not? Or is there something in my heart that wants to? <laughs> That's all the difference in the world. And the only way it's going to get in the heart is when God puts it there. We can't do that. Jesus said, except a man be born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, let's change that word spirit, because we get all hung up on words. Spiritual. That which is spiritual is, spir is, is spiritual. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind listeth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. You can't tell how God does it. <laughs> I'm going to skip down now. The leaven, that's what's being talked about here, the natural inclinations are softened and subdued. New thoughts, new feelings, new motives are implanted. Okay. So we can expect new thoughts, new feelings, new motives to begin working their way out. Because you can't keep them inside. You can't just have them and nothing happens. <laughs> Something is going to happen. 
A new standard of character is set up, the life of Christ. The mind is changed. The faculties are aroused to action in new lines. Man is not endowed with new faculties, but the faculties he has are sanctified. So when you are born again, she said something here that she has an entire article in the Review and Herald that she explains that sentence. Let's look at it for just a moment. When Adam sinned, he had a certain set of faculties. He could see, he could talk, he, he could feel, he had all kinds of different faculties. And all of them were turned towards God as a pure being. His emotions were hooked up to God. His intelligence was connected to God. So all of his actions were godly. <laughs> when he sinned, did he lose all of those faculties? No, he didn't. He didn't lose a single faculty. But he's going to use them the wrong way now. The emotions have been cut off from God. Not connected anymore. But he still has them. And what does he do with them? He turns them on other people instead of God. And what happens to him now? You can't count on, on sinners. They're going to hurt him. And so here he's wandering around with hurt feelings. <laughs> he can never get them satisfied with people. But he's not connected to God. His intelligence, he used to know everything. <laughs> now the intelligence is cut off, and all he knows now is what's right in front of him, what he can see. So man turned into a big mess because he was cut off from God. All of his faculties, he's trying to exercise. He has a will. But instead of the will being tuned to God, to do the will of God... Now the will wants to be a master. And he tries to be a boss. <laughs> he tries to be a control freak. Yeah. And he finds out he can't control anything. <laughs> so sin is a real problem. And so Jesus said... We have to put the leaven in there to turn you back and connect you again. So your emotions are in the right place. You love God and he's never going to disappoint you. Your intelligence now, what he reveals to you, is truth and it's never going to change. And now your will has some place to go because now you can learn what the will of God is. And when your will cooperates with his will, it becomes omnipotent. <laughs> and so, Ellen White, going through this, realizing, well, some people may understand this and they're going to have a question. We better deal with the question. So she deals with it. Here it comes. Very next sentence. Often the question arises, why then? Are there so many claiming to believe God's word in whom there is not seen a reformation? of words, in spirit, and in character. Why are there so many who cannot bear opposition to their purposes and plans, who manifest an unholy temper, and whose words are harsh, overbearing, and passionate? There is seen in their lives the same love of self, the same selfish indulgence, the same temper and hasty speech that is seen in the life of the whirling. There's the same sensitive pride, 
the same yielding to natural inclination, the same perversity of character as if the truth were wholly unknown to them. The reason is they are not converted. No, I have to tell you, when I first saw that one, <laughs> I had to sit down for a while. <laughs> Woo! There's no playing games here. This is not Ellen White talking. This is God talking. He's, he's telling us how come people who are in the church are still like that. Now, don't look around. <laughs> Yeah, this is the place. Oh, Lord, am I in that list? What's that mean? That's not the last sentence here. Now, you go home and you read your book because it's in your book. <laughs> God wants to talk to you out of your book. This is on page 99, by the way. In my, my book at home, I have it all underlined. I used to read that page over and over again in meetings. Just so people understood, we're not just talking here. <laughs> they have not hidden the leaven of truth in the heart. You see? They got it in their brain, but it never made the heart. It has not had opportunity to do its work. Their natural and cultivated tendencies to evil. Natural is evil. Did you get that? Jesus was never natural, please. I don't know why it's such a problem among us to see who Jesus really was in, while he was on this earth. Natural is evil. Jesus was never natural. He was supernatural. <laughs> Their natural and cultivated tendencies to evil have not been submitted to its transforming power. All right, here comes one. I have a, a red line right down the middle of their lives reveal the absence of the grace of Christ and unbelief in his power to transform the character. So who doesn't get it? The people that don't believe when God says, I can do it. They say, no, you can't. You can save the world, but you can't transform me. That's pretty bad, isn't it? That's the problem in our midst today. We have too many people who don't believe what God is saying on this subject. They don't believe in his power to get it done. Continuing. Received into the heart, the leaven of truth will regulate the desires, purify the thoughts, and sweeten the disposition. It quickens the faculties of the mind and the energies of the soul. It enlarges the capacity for feeling, for loving. For Christ's sake, he will labor and deny self that he may aid in the great work of saving souls who are without Christ and without hope. <laughs> now, isn't it amazing? If we keep reading far enough, that's where these thoughts always go, that the Christian will have it placed in his heart because of love to save souls. <laughs> Not because it's what a Christian is supposed to do. <laughs> We can't make ourselves love people. We can't do that. Oh, you'll love somebody that loves you, and you, you like somebody who, who likes what you like, but that's not what we're talking about here. This is for everybody. 
All right, I'm just going to read a little bit more here, and I want to go on. Uh, well, it's hard to break in. Ellen White's thoughts just go, and there's no place. All right, I'm going to go into what this person is that has 11 working. He does not love others because they love and please him, because they appreciate his merits, but because they are Christ's purchased possession. And you know, I've been dealing with that thought lately myself. More and more I look at people, and however way my natural self wants to look at them, my spiritual self says immediately, that person belongs to Jesus. <laughs> no matter what they look like or how they talk, that person belongs to Jesus. And I have no right to relate to that person any other way except the way Jesus wants me to relate to them. They belong to him. He has bought them. <laughs> Try it. Try thinking that every time you see a human and see what happens to you. I mean, there, things will come out a whole different way. You know, you can't abuse a person who you know doesn't belong to you. You have no right. It belongs to Jesus. <laughs> yeah, you can't badmouth a person if you know that Jesus is standing there looking on and saying, wait a minute, you, you have no right to do that. They belong to me. <laughs> If his motives, this is the person who has the leaven in them. If his motives, words, or actions are misunderstood or misinterpreted, he takes no offense. <laughs> That's what it says in the psalm. You can't offend a person who keeps the commandments of God. That's what David understood. You cannot offend that person. He is kind and thoughtful humble in his opinion of himself, yet full of hope, always trusting in the mercy and the love of God. The grace of Christ is to control the temper and the voice. Its working will be seen in politeness and tender regard shown by brother for brother in kind, encouraging words. An angel presence is in the home. The life breathes a sweet perfume which ascends to God as holy incense. Love is manifested in kindness, gentleness, forbearance, and long-suffering. The countenance is changed. Christ abiding in the heart shines out in the face of, the, of those who love him and keep his commandments. Truth is written there. <laughs> the sweet peace of heaven is revealed. There is expressed a habitual gentleness, a more than human love. The leaven of truth works a change in the whole man. <laughs> See, there's the whole heart. There it is. If you're looking for it, she says it different ways. Making the coarse refined, the rough gentle, the selfish generous, by it the impure are cleansed, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Through its life-giving power it brings all there is of mind and soul and strength into harmony with the divine life. Man with his human nature becomes a partaker of divinity. Christ is honored in excellence and perfection of character. As these changes are affected, angels break forth in rapturous song, and God in Christ rejoice over souls fashioned after the divine similitude. <laughs> so the grace has to come into our heart, not into the brain only. <laughs> uh, I believe that God got all the brains that are in the Adventist church. <laughs> you got them all. But now he needs to get the hearts. 
because we have some real grumps among us. <laughs> yeah. We have some people that are not very kind. We have some people that are not too courteous. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we have some people. This was a long time ago, and I'm sure he's not here anymore. I've never seen him again. I'm going to tell you something that happened to me here in this church. While I was teaching here every Sabbath, I came to give a Sabbath school one time, and I had to leave to teach in another church before I could come back here in the afternoon. And as I was leaving, I went out, and the greeter at the door, was a tall fellow, looked at me, and it wasn't a very pleasant look. I mean, he was a greeter. <laughs> <laughs> but I was going the wrong direction as far as he was concerned. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, leaving already? <laughs> and as I left, I thought, you know, they better put him in another door. <laughs> you know, I, I could take that. I, I'm, I'm a seventh dad runner. She can't hurt me. <laughs> but what if that had been <laughs> a visitor? They probably never would have come back again with that kind of an attitude. We really need to think what we're doing to people. <laughs> and worse, what we're doing to ourselves because Jesus said, by the standard in which you judge other people and the way you do things to other people is the way we're going to judge you. <laughs> That's in man of blessings also. All right, let's continue here. I'm not going to get all the white places I want to get today. Uh, Christ Object Lessons 48. There are many who claim to serve God, but who have no experimental knowledge of him. That was Ellen White's word for experience. Okay. Their desire to do his will is based upon their own inclination, not upon the deep conviction of the Holy Spirit. Their conduct is not brought into harmony with the law of God. They profess to accept Christ as their Savior, but they do not believe that he will give them power to overcome their sins. There it is again. You see, this is something we must believe or it's not going to happen. In another place in this book, she says, have you settled into Satan's easy chair? <laughs> You're just going to sit there and let God do everything? <laughs> well, he's not going to do everything. <laughs> he wants you to cooperate with him. God works and you work. Success. <laughs> Many feel a sense of estrangement from God, a realization of their bondage to self and sin. They make efforts to reform, but they do not crucify self. They do not give themselves entirely into the hands of Christ, seeking for divine power to do his will. So there it is again a different way. Entirely, everything. True holiness is wholeness to the service of God. And she didn't make that up. The word holy in the original language means whole, <laughs> holy. All right, here's the next sentence. Christ asks for an unreserved consecration for undivided service, he demands the heart, the mind, the soul, the strength. He who lives to himself is not a Christian. 
I have begun looking some of those up. She says several different ways how a person is not a Christian. Oh, that's a terrible study. Christ gave all for us. And those who receive Christ will be ready to sacrifice all for the sake of their Redeemer. Okay, that's all I want to read there. Let's get to Acts of the Apostles. It took me too long to get here. Let's go to chapter, what is it, chapter 30? Page 309. We'll begin looking at a few things. I'm not going to read everything. I just want you to see some very important things. Uh, and, and you study it carefully. All right, the chapter is entitled, Call to Reach a Higher Standard. And that's what we're trying to understand here, that if God makes us that one heart so that we can go one way, what does it look like? How do we get there? That's what we want to know. How do we cooperate with him? Beginning with the very first sentence, in the hope of impressing vividly upon the minds of the Corinthian believers the importance of firm self-control, strict temperance, and unflagging zeal in the service of Christ, Paul in his letter to them made a striking comparison between the Christian warfare and the celebrated foot races. <laughs> okay, well, we know about races. We know about the Olympics and so forth. Well, I thought it was interesting, the word Christian warfare. This is not a, oh, I'm so happy, I'm saved, I'm smiling all the time, and I just sit here rejoicing and saying hallelujah. That's not my, my Bible doesn't say any of that. My Bible says Christian warfare, a fight. There's an enemy to be overcome. All right, these foot races. Going down to the next little paragraph, it says the contests were governed by strict regulations from which there was no appeal. <laughs> In other words, you couldn't change the rules. I recently read a sermon where that's what the pastor said, God changed the rules. And I wondered, what kind of a God does this pastor serve that he doesn't know God doesn't do that? <laughs> Those who desired their names entered as competitors for the prize at first to undergo a severe preparatory training. Severe, there's the key word. You're just getting out and start jogging every morning to see how you do. Severe. Tough. Hard. <laughs> Your tongue hanging out. <laughs> It said in preparation to signing up. <laughs> they, they just wanted to see if you had the step to even sign on to this. <laughs> Harmful indulgence of appetite or any other gratification that would lower mental or physical vigor was strictly forbidden. So I guess we're not the first people to understand this. We're talking about things that actually happened back there in the time of Paul. We know about those Greeks. They had this all set up. They knew how to run races. <laughs> and they knew if you're going to have a good race, you're going to have good people running. <laughs> These are going to be hard, hard people <laughs> trained to the max. We want a good race. Every movement must be certain. Okay, I'm going to go down a little bit here. Uh, 310, I'm going to give you some numbers. Point two, that means if you divide the page into 10 pieces, I'm at point two. Point five would be the middle, okay? All right, 10.2. In, in the last part of that paragraph, it says, the possibility of lifelong injury or of death was not looked upon as too great a risk to run 
for the sake of the honor awarded the successful contestant. So when they started training, they knew what they were training for. This could ruin me for life. <laughs> I could break a hip. I could bang my head. <laughs> I could die. They said, oh, but it's worth it. Oh, I'm going to get the prize. What was the prize? <laughs> Some weeds. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I don't think I could give up my enthusiasm for that. <laughs> These people actually were willing to die so they could get. And Paul's making a point here. <laughs> Paul is saying, now let's pay attention here, folks. <laughs> These men do this. We've seen them. They're going to do it next year and the year after that. Paul emphasized the preparation necessary. Page 311 at the top. Paul emphasized the preparation necessary to the success of the contestants in the race. The preliminary discipline, the abstemious diet, the necessity for temperance. The, the runners put aside every indulgence. Every. We don't even know what that word means. Every. They did. They stopped doing everything that would get in the way of running this race. And they had a pretty big list. By severe and continuous discipline, they trained their muscles to strengthen endurance, that when the day of contest should arrive, they might put the heaviest tax upon their powers. <laughs> so they were doing this severe discipline every day, every day, every day, so they could put it to the max when it finally came time. <laughs> How much more important that the Christian whose eternal interests are at stake bring appetite and passion under subjection to reason and the will of God. Never must he allow his attention to be diverted by amusements, luxuries, or ease. What a list. <laughs> what a list. Is God talking to us in this century? <laughs> Is he talking to us city folk? <laughs> Is he talking to us that he just pulled out of the world? Does he really like want us to be the way they are in the Bible? <laughs> want to hear lots of people talk today? No, he doesn't. He's, he's made a different way for us. He's going to excuse us. He's going to say, oh, that was too tight. <laughs> oh. Reason. Enlightened by the teachings of God's word and guided by his spirit must hold the reins of control. And after this has been done, <laughs> you thought we got there already, didn't you? That's just how you start. <laughs> and after this has been done, the Christian must put forth the utmost exertion in order to gain the victory. In the Corinthian games, the last few strides of the contestant in the race were made were with agonizing effort to keep up undiminished speed. <laughs> Now, if you've ever run races in school or whatever, you know what that is. You're, you're oh, I don't have any more. 
<laughs> but you got to keep going because the rest of them are still moving. <laughs> So the Christian, as he nears the goal, will press onward with even more zeal and determination than at first. Than at first. So it's no time to relax. It's time to start stretching those muscles. <laughs> it's time to realize I need more discipline now. I've got to learn how to fight more now. All right, that's all I want to say there. You read that. It goes on. Read it again carefully. Dig out the key words. No, back to it, not only for yourself, but to help somebody else understand what real Christianity is. All right, let's look quickly at uh, chapter 55. This is where I want to go today. This is uh, page 557. Oh, what happened here? Okay, I'm going to have to come at this a different way. The computer's balking on me. Okay. This chapter is entitled Transformed by Grace. This is one of my favorite chapters in uh, Acts of the Apostles. This chapter just says so much. We're not going to get to it all today, but you study this one carefully also. We want to begin by understanding the Apostle John. We talked a little bit about him. In the first part of the paragraph there, she describes John as having a violent temper. <laughs> I don't know if anybody in here has a violent temper, but, or had a violent temper, but John did. He had a violent temper. They said, rain fire down on those people. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the places. But then it says, He beheld the tenderness and the forbearance of Jesus, and he heard his lessons of humility and patience, and day by day, his heart, his heart was drawn out to Christ until he lost sight of self in love for his master. It doesn't say in, in admiration of that brilliant mind. He didn't, doesn't say that. He loved him with his heart. The power of tenderness. Ellen White likes to use words. The power of tenderness. <laughs> See those two words? The power of tenderness. The majesty of meekness. The strength of patience. <laughs> it's not the way we use words. <laughs> that he saw in the daily life of the Son of God filled his soul with admiration. There's some good, more good sentences there. I want to skip down, though. Second, uh, 558, about the second sentence uh, coming down, it says, By resisting the divine influence, Judas, he dishonored the master whom he professed to love. John word earnestly against his faults. But Judas violated his conscience. Let's see. That's where the damage begins. When we know something and we say, well, that's not that important. 
thing. That's what Judas did. He learned how to really do that well. He always said, well, let's give it to the poor people. And I'll take my commission while we're at it. <laughs> yeah, he always paid himself for helping out. That's why he sold Jesus at the end. That was his payment for making Jesus do what was right. He didn't think Jesus was going to get killed. He said, Jesus is just dragging his feet. I have to help him here. I have to force him to make his play. <laughs> and Judas was absolutely shocked when Jesus was led away. He said, what is this? I didn't mean for them to take him. <laughs> And when he saw things couldn't be turned around, he went out and he hanged himself. He said, I have shed innocent blood. That was not a confession of repentance. It was just a fact. Violation of conscience. Instead of walking in the light, he chose... He chose to walk in darkness. Now, I hope you're picking up these key words now as we have talked about decision. He made a decision. And that one lasted forever. We have to make a decision to be obedient and that will last forever. See? There's two different decisions. They have results. I'm not going to read everything about Judas. I don't want to get too involved with him here. I want to understand what this is about the whole heart. John and Judas are representatives of those who profess to be Christ's followers. Both these disciples had the same opportunities. Okay? To study and follow the divine pattern. Both were closely associated with Jesus and were privileged to listen to his teaching. Each possessed serious defects of character. And each had access to the divine grace that transforms character. But while one in humility was learning of Jesus, the other revealed he was not a doer of the word. There's the difference, see? So don't let people tell you that grace and faith covers everything. Well, grace and faith aren't going to do you any good if you're not a doer. <laughs> it's that simple. God is not going to save people that don't do. Now, the other churches hate that because they don't have any doers. If somebody stands up and talks about obedience in the mainline churches, they say, oh, you're out of grace, brother. You have fallen from grace. You're into works again. Well, there is a, a sad situation of somebody trying to save themselves by their works. Yeah, but that's not a Christian. A Christian does what Jesus does because he's following Jesus. He's yoked up with him. He goes with Jesus, goes doing the same things. One dying to self and overcoming sin was sanctified through the truth. The other one resisting the transforming power, indulging selfish desires was brought into the bondage of Satan. So there are two paths. One is the gospel. The other is self-righteousness. I'm going to go to heaven because God has to take me. <laughs> Beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, he's changed from glory to glory until he is like him whom he adores. All right, I'm going to skip down now to page 560. True sanctification. True sanctification comes through the working out of the principle of love. God is love, 
and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. 1 John 4, 16. The life of him in whose heart Christ abides will reveal practical godliness. Maybe. No, it doesn't say maybe. <laughs> it says will. There's no maybe about this. The character will be purified, elevated, ennobled, and glorified. Pure doctrine will blend with works of righteousness. Heavenly precepts will mingle with holy practices. Those who would gain the blessing of sanctification must first learn the meaning of self-sacrifice. So you see there's justification by faith in the merits of Jesus only. That's what a lost person has to have. But as soon as you become a Christian, the very first thing that happens is Jesus puts in the heart the spirit of self-sacrifice. And now you begin growing as a Christian. The spirit of self-sacrifice. The cross of Christ is the central pillar on which hangs the far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Let's go together. <laughs> Now, Jesus said that, and we all know that scripture. <laughs> but somehow we didn't see it as the game plan. <laughs> we thought, oh, it's just another one of those sayings. No, it's not another one of those sayings. Jesus meant for us to do it. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. We tried to follow him, and nobody told us you can't do it if you don't do the first two things. It is the fragrance of our love for our fellow men that reveals our love for God. <laughs> it is patience and service that brings rest to the soul. It is through humble, diligent, faithful toil that the welfare of Israel is promoted. Sanctification is not the work of a moment. That's what the churches today teach, by the way. You're sanctified because you believe. Just believe. Well, that's not in the Bible either. Sanctification is not the work of a moment, an hour, a day, but of a lifetime. In other words, your whole life is a separated out life, a set apart life for the service to God. It's not gained by a happy flight of feeling. So don't expect to go to some meeting and have some, some evangelist stir you all up and make you sing hurrah. It doesn't come that way. But it is the result of constantly dying to self, to sin, sorry, dying to sin, and constantly living for Christ. Wrongs cannot be righted, nor reformations wrought in their character by feeble, Intermittent efforts. It's only by long, persevering effort, sore discipline, and stern conflict that we shall overcome. So have you wondered why you have every now and then got the feeling, I'm not overcoming? Well, where's the stern conflict? <laughs> You're not going to get there unless you do it God's way. You know, there's a little thought wandering around in some brochures and some tracks and some tapes that says it's easy to be saved. Oh, well, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. I have never read that in the Spirit Prophecy. We better pay attention what it is we're putting in front of us. Because if you start reading some things and hearing some things and you're believing them and God didn't say them, you're going to have a problem. You already have a problem, but you don't know it. 
We need to study the Bible. We need to see what the Spirit of Prophecy says because that's God talking to us today. But read it for yourself. <laughs> Don't believe it until God tells you. This is me talking to you. <laughs> We know not one day how strong will be our conflict the next. So long as Satan reigns, we shall have self to subdue, besetting sins to overcome. So long as life shall last, there will be no stopping place, no point which we can reach and say, I have fully attained. <laughs> Sanctification is the result of lifelong What's the next word? What's the last word? Obedience. Lifelong obedience. Now that doesn't say lifelong thinking about obeying, lifelong desiring to obey, lifelong thinking someday I'm going to do this, and in the last 10 minutes of my life I'll finally obey. This means obeying every day of your life as a Christian for your whole life. <laughs> That's what God calls sanctification. Now, you have been prepared for this kind of talk, okay? We can talk to you straight <laughs> and clear and plain. But there are many churches, if I talk like this, they'd boot me out right now and say, you're making this too hard. <laughs> well, don't argue with me. I'm just reading the words. This is God talking. And I don't think he's going to change his mind. So if we don't like this, and the flesh doesn't like it, I know that. <laughs> if, if we find that there's something in us that doesn't like this, we better figure out. It's the flesh, and that flesh isn't going anywhere. It's going to die. <laughs> nothing, nothing in the universe can save the flesh. It's going to die. <laughs> the only element of you that's going to be in heaven is your spiritual self, your, the new you. I'm going to read this because I dealt with the two leaders of the movement that was taking Adventists out left and right all over the world because they were teaching perfection. Their way, not God's way. None, this is page 560, it must be about 561, it shifts over. Yeah, 561. None of the apostles and prophets ever claimed to be without sin. Men who have lived the nearest to God, men who would sacrifice life itself rather than knowingly commit a wrong act, men whom God has honored with divine light and power have confessed the sinfulness of their nature. How did Paul say it? Romans 7, I know. I know that in me, that is in my flesh, there is no good thing. So you can say that every day to God, and it's true. <laughs> and you better know it. Your flesh has nothing to do with, with the kingdom of heaven. Nothing. The flesh does not want to obey. And the flesh says, I'm not going to obey. <laughs> But the leaven in you, in your heart, says, I can, I will. <laughs> Have you been saying it this week? I can, I will. God says to say that. The devil hates that. When somebody figures that out, they can really say it. I can, I will. <laughs> Sanctified lips will never give utterance to such presumptuous words. I am sinless. I am holy. 
Well, these two individuals that I just mentioned, that's exactly what they said everywhere they went. And they told people, you can say that too. I'm sinless and I'm holy. And they got all kinds of people to join to them. Seventh-day Adventist. They left the church to join that. I know a little bit about it because those two men invited me to be the third one with them to go around the world with this new movement. They said, join us. You know, if you ever hear that, you better start running. Join us. You know what I told them when they said that to me? I said, why? Why, why should I join you? I've already got Jesus. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, the remnant people on this earth. He's not going to raise another people. We better start getting it right. They didn't like me very much. But you know, when they finally broke up, because perfectionists can't stand each other, <laughs> they always look at the other one and say, you're not perfect enough. <laughs> And so when they finally broke up, one of them called me months later. And he says, uh, I've gotten out of that now. And I didn't say anything. He said, do you believe that? <laughs> I said, well, if you say it, I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what I believe. <laughs> if that's what you believe. And he says he was teaching some people now how to have joy in their Christianity. I said, you're teaching? He said, yes. I said, do you believe in the spirit of prophecy? He said, well, certainly. I said, well, you better read early writings, starting about page 100. Because she says people who in their past have believed in the era of perfection, God cannot use in his work. He can't trust them with his people. So you see, there's a lot more to this than people want to recognize. God has a standard. He has a, a plan of salvation that he's not going to deviate from. And we have all kinds of people making noise around who don't really understand what God has said. But it's simple. For us, all we need to know is Jesus has paid the price. His blood, the Father accepts. It's the most precious thing in the universe. It got Jesus in. And we went in with him. We are in heavenly places, Ephesians says so, with Jesus. Now, as long as you have the blood, he covers your past. You have no sin in your past. None. And when the Father looks at you today, he sees no sin that he can record for you. Because he sees Jesus. And then he says, let's walk together, let's be yoked together. But you have to make a decision. We can't walk together until you decide. We're going to walk together. You pledge to me, I will obey you by your grace. I will obey. That's what God is waiting for in our midst as a people. For people to tell him, I'm going to obey by your grace. Isn't it strange that we have to teach our people today in the year 2007 that Christians are supposed to obey when we're out telling everybody to keep the fourth commandment? <laughs> How did we forget there's nine other ones? <laughs> the first one is you will have no other God. No other God. Not your self-indulgence. Not your passion. 
Not your pleasure, not your ease, not your, oh, God says those are all idols. You have false gods. And do you know what he says to do once you realize it? He says, give it up. Get rid of it. <laughs> Ellen White talking to one lady about the book she was reading. She says, get them out of your house. <laughs> I think we just ran out of time. Maybe we uh, ought to let it go here. There's a lot more in this chapter. You want to really, really get into this chapter... I want to read the last paragraph or two in this chapter before we close. The greatest praise that men can bring to God is to become consecrated channels through whom he can work. Time is rapidly passing into eternity. Let us not keep back from God that which is his own. Let us not refuse him that which, though it cannot be given with merit, cannot be denied without ruin. He asks for a whole heart. Give it to him. It is his. <laughs> Both by creation and by redemption. He asks for your intellect. Give it to him. It is his. He asks for your money. Give it to him. It is his. You are not your own. You are bought with a price. God requires the homage of a sanctified soul which has prepared itself by exercise of the faith that works by love to serve him. He holds up before us the highest ideal, even Perfection. Oh, there's a real one. See? There's a real perfection. He asks us to be absolutely and completely for him in this world as he is for us in the presence of God. This is the will of God concerning you, even your sanctification. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 Is it your will also? <laughs> this has to be God talking to the human soul. Ellen White wrote this a long time ago. She's dead. These questions hold. God says here to each of us, Is this your will also? Your sins may be as mountains before you, but if you humble your heart and confess your sins, trusting in the merits of a crucified and risen Savior, he will forgive and he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. God demands of you entire conformity to his law. This law is the echo of his voice. See, that's God talking to me. And he's saying holier. Yes, holier still. Desire the fullness of the grace of Christ. Let your heart be filled with an intense longing for his righteousness. The work of which God's word declares is peace and its effect, quietness and assurance forever. Well, that's what Isaiah says over there. As your soul yearns after God, you will find more and still more of the unsearchable riches of his grace. As you contemplate these riches, you will come into possession of them and will reveal the merits of the Savior's sacrifice, the protection of his righteousness, the fullness of his wisdom, and his power to present you before the Father without spot and blameless. Read these two chapters carefully. 
Really get in and have God talk to you. Hear his voice talking to you. Don't see anybody else. He's talking to you. I was going to give you a couple more chapters this week, but I really think you should spend more time with these two chapters. We'll give you a couple next week that really go after what we're trying to understand here. All right, let's have prayer. Father, we thank you that there are none so vile, none who have fallen so low, that this power does not work. Whoever we think we are, help us to know you are able, above all that we can think or ask, to see it through with us. Bless us, Lord, as we continue to open our minds and our hearts to you, that you may speak to us, that you may show us, that you may live it in us. May we know and may we be able to talk like people who know that we belong to you and you are ours. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.